Hello, my name is Wade Self, and I'm a scientist who works to develop new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. So, you see, that's why people just need to have a little more discipline. They, they just need to be a little more focused. Hi, my name is Wade Self, and I'm a scientist that works to develop new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Now imagine if that was your life, where your mind was in a state that you couldn't string together thoughts in a coherent conversation. You couldn't remember a statement that you had said not even a minute before. That is the reality for my grandfather, who is a victim of Alzheimer's disease. And the dangers of this disease extend far beyond mere lapses in conversation. So my grandfather uses a walker, but due to the disease, his memory loss at times makes it that he forgets about his physical limitations in old age. And this led to an event where he fell down a flight of stairs, cracking multiple ribs, needing to be immediately rushed to the hospital. And to think of the immense physical pain that he went through, breaking a rib, maybe would just as equally painful as thinking about our family's realization that Grandpa, who had been in that house for 50 years, raising a family and living a happy life, was no longer safe in his own home. And to think, when I go there and visit now in his assisted living home, and look at the other people that are there with him, he's considered one of the lucky ones that has this terrible disease, where others have forgotten the ability to communicate, to feed themselves, or to even recognize their loved ones. And currently, we have no effective treatments for this disease. And as family members, and close loved ones, we are helpless bystanders to watching this disease take away the being, the identity of our loved ones each day. Now I know I've painted a very grim picture of, of our current state in fighting this disease, but today I want to offer you a message of hope one where advancements in Alzheimer's research have led us to a vision and a potential reality where we have not only made discoveries, but learned from our previous mistakes in drug development to try to create an effective therapy for this disease and prove that a cure does exist for people like my grandfather. So if we zoom in now, we're at the person level, and we go down to the brain level of what is happening in Alzheimer's disease. What we've known for a long time is that these deficits in cognition, in memory, are due to the loss of neurons, the cells inside the brain that store and transmit information. And as researchers, we're really focused on the disease state, but as a trained neuroscientist, I often think about how incredible it is that a neuron functions normally at all. But not only that it functions, but that it's doing that every day, every second. It's doing it correctly most of the time and throughout our lives. And to be able to perform its proper function Neurons are synthesizing 
thousands of new proteins at any time within our brains. And each of these proteins are unique to perform their specific function. And they are not just what we think about in terms of ingesting them as food to help our muscles grow. You know, this idea of a nutrient. When we get to the microscopic level, and think about these proteins, they have these beautiful, specific three-dimensional structures that help them perform their function. And they need to be in that specific shape in order to properly execute that function, to allow a neuron to work. It has to be in this proper shape, and then it has to be in the right place at the right time in a neuron cell body to successfully execute all of the commands that are required of our brain for us to function properly. For me to move my lips and make these audible noises that are then going into your ears and being processed by neurons and to say, oh, I understand that that is language and that's a sentence and this is an idea that you're communicating to me. And they need to be in the right place at the right time to then store that moment in both of our brains as this memory, as this moment right now. That is a beautiful thing. And that's why I love to think about these proteins within neurons as beautiful works of art, where every fold, every detail is crucial for our proper functioning, for our existence as human beings. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end at some point, and these proteins don't live forever. With various signaling and insults inside of a neuron, these proteins begin to lose that shape. They become misfolded. They're no longer able to perform their proper function. And a new protein needs to be synthesized to replace the damage from that protein. It's lived at the end of its life. Luckily, we have the machinery within our cells, within neurons, that recognize this event happening. And we break down that protein and recycle those parts to then synthesize new proteins. But as we age, this process begins to slow down a little bit versus a very clean inside of a neuron. We might see some buildup of proteins that aren't getting cleared as fast. And that's okay. That's just happening in old age. But something is triggered in the context of Alzheimer's disease, where this buildup becomes more than what the cell can bear. And that cascade results in this toxicity and loss and death of the neuron within the brain leading to that cognitive deficit, those memory deficits, when those neurons are no longer there performing their function. And we can see that by cutting into the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease after they've passed. We've actually recognized this phenomenon for over 100 years, that there's this protein buildup within Alzheimer's patients. And we've called these pathologies plaques and tangles. These plaques are found on the outside of neurons in the brain. And these tangles are found within those neuron cell bodies. And with vigorous research and definition of the staging of Alzheimer's disease, researchers have identified that these plaques are the first thing to form in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients and that it's composed of this protein called amyloid beta. So if we think about developing a treatment for Alzheimer's disease, and we know that's the first thing to appear, and then there are deficits associated with memory, loss of cognition, and on death. The industry used that rationale as a strategy to target amyloid beta protein. Let's prevent these plaques, and we hypothesize, that that would prevent the disease. So, we developed these drugs that target amyloid beta protein, or the processing of amyloid beta protein, and conducted human clinical trials where you test that hypothesis in the context of disease 
and see if you improve the status of a person with the condition. And to think about everything that goes into a clinical trial, I like to think about it like a game of darts, where these new experimental drugs are that dart. And our interpretation, our analysis, is that dartboard, where hopefully we're hitting the bullseye and we confirm that there's an effective treatment for, in this case, Alzheimer's disease. And let's say, based on the past, if we target amyloid beta protein. But besides the bullseye, there's a lot of ways to score in darts. So other things that you can learn, possibly. You don't hit the bullseye, but maybe you hit a single five. Shows that the drug is safe in people. Very important if we're going to use it as a strategy. Think about the double 15. We want to hit amyloid beta protein, so do we have a way of showing in a trial that we are indeed hitting the intended target that we think the drug is acting on? And as you see, as you combine all these things, you gain information that provides insight into what an effective <coughs> treatment strategy for Alzheimer's disease would be. But in the past, we've been limited due to the dire need for treatment and limited technology. And we've been playing this game of darts where we're essentially just trying to hit the bullseye, which is a very small target in the context of the entire game. And with the failures that then came from treating with these anti-amyloid beta agents, we didn't come out with much more information than when we came in. We treated Alzheimer's disease patients. We have not seen improvements in cognition, so it's not a good treatment. But now we're back to ground zero with no momentum or other information to think about what are the most effective treatment strategies. Additionally, when we've thought more about these preliminary clinical trials, these first clinical trials in patients with Alzheimer's disease, looking at the patients themselves that were in this study have helped explain some of our other shortfalls as well. Where if we think about our normal healthy brain, where all of our neurons are intact, we have all of these proper connections, everything's working fine, versus what we're seeing in an Alzheimer's disease brain when <laughs> there's memory loss, a lack of cognition, massive neuronal loss. We can see physically the dark words becoming even smaller, where as neuroscientists we've begun to learn in our process of learning and memory storage that most of these damages, once neuronal death occurs, is irreversible. <laughs> so if we are doing a trial in which there's already irreversible loss, we're now essentially saying that we're going to find an effective treatment for the disease, even though you can't really go back past where you started from. So that single bullseye, now we're basically trying to throw a dart in a grain of sand, probably blindfolded too. It's really hard. And this is by no fault of researchers themselves. This is how you learn. This is the process of research. You have to do things in a vigorous, systematic process and learn from your mistakes. But what's exciting for me is to think about how advances in technology have opened up a potential avenue where we are creating those bigger dartboards learning more information, and designing better strategies for prospective therapies. And the first way we've been able to do this is through advancements in our ability to read human genes made of DNA within cells. You know, the instruction manual that leads to the production of proteins within a cell. What initially took over 10 years to do, sequencing human genes, now can be done in the span of one or two days. 
and researchers are constantly finding new genes that are causative of Alzheimer's disease that can be passed down in families, but also key risk factors and variants in our genes that point to specific pathways that may be open to targeting for therapies with the disease. So with this new ammunition in our belts for this game, we could potentially create new darts that target these different pathways that we're identifying through genetic research. We can identify people that are vulnerable to getting Alzheimer's disease and track them in the context of their disease progression and when we should intervene and when we should have them within a clinical trial. But then there's still that question of when should we intervene? And that's where the advances in technology of biomarkers is really exciting in the Alzheimer's field. So the idea of a biomarker, the ability to mark the biology or the health of a person in real time. So think about reading your glucose levels from the blood or getting an x-ray. That's a biomarker that tells you information. If you've got a broken arm, besides the pain that you're experiencing, that something is indeed wrong. And that's where we're getting better as a field in Alzheimer's disease. Where before I showed you the buildup of these plaques that we could only see after taking the brains of patients who have died from the disease. We're now developing these imaging agents where we can see these plaques and tangles light up on the screen before we intervene with a trial, when we're intervening with our treatment, compare it between someone that is taking a drug and someone that is on a control to test hypotheses, to see if plaques actually go down with our treatments, to see if we can target tangles, to see if the structure of the brain is getting better. We can also use it as a screening tool to say, oh, it looks like this person's getting Alzheimer's disease, even before we see deficits in memory or cognitive impairment. We can also do the same thing in a less invasive, time-intensive procedure with the use of fluid-based biomarkers by collecting the spinal fluid of patients that may be at risk for Alzheimer's disease or in a clinical trial. Or even better, blood samples, something we probably all had sampled before when we went to the doctor. And we're creating new measurements based on our understanding of these biomarkers that are found in blood of being the earliest signs that may detect that a person is at risk for Alzheimer's disease and needs that therapeutic intervention. So, with that three-pronged approach, I would say, in this advancements of technology, we're trying to do better in designing this game, in making sure that we're keeping score in the right way, that we've got the right tools at our disposal to test and hit that bullseye. And I know I'm making this analogy to a game, and don't get me wrong, I don't want that to detract from the gravity of the situation that we currently face. Because for families like mine, you know, the toll, the burden, the pain of this disease is too late. The individual that is affected by the disease, losing their identity, the wife that has to watch their loved one decay, family that has an immense burden to take care of that person. But I am hopeful that with these advances in technology, with the commitment that we have to research, that there will be a day where your family and your future family won't have to go through those similar burdens. And who knows, as we're improving these trial designs and creating smarter treatment strategies, maybe that cure is already out there, and we just need to design the right experiment to prove its power. Thank you.